Now I wanted to ask you about um, touring the UK firstly. I mean, I know the UK is a place that you're very fond of. Tell us about your experiences of coming over the show and playing here. I really like the UK because people will be mean to you to your face. And, you know, like there's a guy that does, uh, helps us with radio promotion. And he saw us play a couple of times when we were drinking at the bar. And he started just making fun of my guitar playing, <laughs> and it was it was so funny. Not even my friends would like you know they're too sensitive to, to say that. So I think I appreciate there's at least a certain level of openness that that's pretty cool. Let's talk about the album. You know, it's been applauded and commended, and you know, loves crushing diamond. And I understand the project started for you in late 2011, early 2012, mm -hmm. and you were really into field recordings and recording jams. Tell us about that. Um, well, I found this tiny field recorder that was very cheap on sale, and I thought it might be fun to just have it in my pocket all the time. And normally I'm not very good at remembering to capture, record, or write about things. But there was something about it just always being there, about the size of a cell phone, that I would just like reach for it when something was happening. And <clears throat> I think that when I just sit down with a guitar and try to play chords, I very rarely feel inspired to make a song. You know, it's more like, this sounds like a Counting Crows song or something. Like, I never feel good. But if there's like a moment that was interesting or a little sound that can be loops that I can write on top of that is like, organic or stuttery or whatever, then I think it helps me feel like I'm making a piece of art instead of just writing some dumb song. And tell us about the process of making music. I understand you like to put tons and tons of tracks on each song and you know, almost all of the songs on the album have hundred separate sounds, you know. And how do you go about condensing and trimming it down and getting it to the actual finished product? I think I'm pretty neurotic. Um, on the music program that I use, there's an option. It's almost like a little line graph where you can make the sound gradually uh, quieter, or louder. And so I could never bring myself to just cut a sound out. I would just like fade it out and bring it a little bit back in. And um, it definitely, <clears throat> it was very frustrating working on the record because near the end, it would just crash my computer like every 15 or 30 minutes. <laughs> and, and, um, like, there was one song, Advanced Falconry, actually, whenever it crashed, it would it would save it right before, and so it's like, Advanced Falconry crashed, but then if it happened again, it would add that word again. So the final version that I was working on before it got sent to mastering was, Advanced Falconry crashed, 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 crashed. <laughs> One of the aspects of the album you mentioned and you touched upon is that you hope that it kind of conveys seasons of devastation and you wanted, like, sort of wanted people to stop thinking about things in binary terms, whether they are good or bad. I mean, how did this come into play? Um, well, yeah, definitely the record was started as kind of a way for me to deal with a feeling of hopelessness, just dealing with family and friends that were in pretty rough situations. It kind of seemed like, um, yeah, that there was no way to help them. And so it was kind of the first time that I felt like it was a whole season of that in my life, of, of just people struggling that I, that I really love. So I um, couldn't really handle it in Boston and visited a friend in St. Louis for almost half a year. And I didn't know anyone there. And so I spent a lot of time just writing and being by myself. <clears throat> and at the beginning of the time writing that record, the lyrics were very sad. And it was like kind of an emo record. And I think the longer, the more time I spent, the more time I had to write, it kind of got more and more hopeful. And it's exactly like, as you said in the question, but I was learning that it's kind of silly to think about things as good or bad, or even thinking, like, things are sad right now, I should do something to make myself feel good. You know, like, just looking at the whole spectrum of the human experience, like, there has to be seasons of, of destruction, and there has to be seasons of rebirth, and, um, you know, I, I was 25 when, when I made most of the record, 
And so I think there's just a certain point in your life where you really f- figure out that the point of life is not to feel comfortable or good, but really, like, maybe there is no point, but you just got to, like, do well, stuff. Was it for you? Was it reinvigorating? Was it, you know, was it compelling for you using the medium of music to process your feelings? Uh, you know, after seeing people close to you, you know, feel so low with mental disorder or, or addiction? Yeah, um, it. I had no expectations that working on it would make me feel better. It was more at the time almost wanting to sort feelings that felt too complex to just work on in my own head. But that was a very interesting byproduct that kind of sorting through it and then making something out of those conclusions can alleviate so much of like the burden of sadness. I I guess, you know, I've I've heard of the idea of music therapy and stuff like that, but it's actually something I've been thinking about lately of like reading more about because it's, you know, it's definitely real. Tell us about the live translation of mutual benefit material. I mean, when you're performing live, what kind of motivation shaped the live, you know, what kind of discussions do you have? Do you like to reimagine and rework it when you play live? Yeah, I I think it was it's been a very interesting progression from October from when this record came out to now where <clears throat> when I was making the record I had no idea how it was going to be reproduced live and you know there's so many instruments and so many things fading in and out and there's like moments where it feels orchestral but other moments where it feels you know like blippy and bloopy and ambient and so um we like did it the best we could in 2013 and then we had this big tour planned for January and we like just got a booking agent and like you know there was a lot of pressure to have a series of good shows so we had like I think a couple weeks of practice and we were <laughs> in this practice space in a basement in Brooklyn that wasn't even big enough to fit all of us. <laughs> Like, I remember vividly, like, I think we had to keep the door open so Jake could bow, like, um, and it was, it was very stressful. We kind of, like, there wasn't a lot of discussion straight up about, like, what are we exactly doing, but I think we're all on the same page where it's, like, we're not trying to reproduce every sound with the instrument that made it, and it's more, like, these songs convey a certain feeling and a certain thematic quality and it's way more important if that comes across um, than for it to sound anything like it does on the record. Before we finish up, I wanted to get your views on a few of the, um, the tweets that you've put up and <laughs> oh, no. what led you to put, uh, what did you actually say that? Um, firstly, searching the streets of Bushwick for the perfect piece of scrap wood. <laughs> I wish okay. more interviews did this. <laughs> um, what I was doing that day is, I think that was back in the winter, if I remember right, but um, we had to find a piece of wood to lay across the keyboard stand so I could put this new loop pedal that I got. And actually, I never found that piece of scrap wood. And in fact, now I use my, my giant guitar case and um, my band makes fun of me all the time for it because I get up there and there's this giant thing and they're like, why don't you just put a piece of wood there? (laughs) So you really hit a nerve. And here's another one. Um, Touring overseas is making me think of electricity more than ever. (laughs) (laughs) Do you want to tell us what that was about? Yeah, I blew up my keyboard. (laughs) (laughs) We were were in Hamburg. (laughs) We were in Hamburg, and I just, like, I knew in my head that the voltage here is 220 and that U.S. voltage is 110, but I didn't understand exactly what that meant, and so I, I plugged in my keyboard, and this weird smell happened, and then it turned off, and I, like, totally fried. I, it was it was the worst feeling. We played that show that night with, I had to use another one, uh, like a... Korg micro synth or whatever, whatever everyone has, but I couldn't find the right patch and it sounded like a, like a high school prom. And we had to drive like three hours out of our way uh, to go to Cologne, Germany to like find a replacement keyboard.